Hi there, I'm Dean Heskin, President and CEO of Swiss American Trading Corporation, and you are tuned in to our podcast, The Secret War on Cash, where we take a hard and in-depth look at some of the changing dynamics in our financial markets and our economy. I do this with my co-host, who's here with me today, Chris Agalestos. Chris, how are you this morning? I'm doing very well, thank you. Glad to see you uh, survive Parents Weekend with your daughter down in Tucson. Um, <laughs> yeah. She's down at U of A, which is not my probably my first pick of schools. I like the one over your shoulder a little better. That uh, oh, yeah. helmet got the back ASU there. going on there. But, you know, you have to let them go where they want to go. Anyway, That's it. Well, let's get into talking about uh, our topic today, actually. We're going to start off, lead in with the Buffett indicator. Yeah, and this is a very interesting. We've covered Warren Buffett in our in earlier podcasts, where you know he has been pretty aggressive or active, we'll say, in uh, selling off stocks and uh, a lot of banking stocks. In fact, he's not been um, not been any too shy about that. Doesn't really discuss why he's doing what he's doing, but he's been selling off a lot yeah. B of A in particular. Mm -hmm. But this Buffett indicator. Pretty simple, actually. I mean, it takes a look at what the uh, stock market, total U.S. stock market value is, which it, according to the example here, as of August 31st, uh, $59.7 trillion, and what the annualized gross domestic product of the country is, which, again, at August 31st of this year, $28 trillion.56. And you take that 59.7 and you divide that to 28.56 and you get 209%, mm -hmm. and which is a lot of math. And for those who are tuning in, <laughs> if you like graphs, you like charts, you like math, you're going to love this. Just click on that link, go to the article, and you can kind of walk through it yourself. But the current ratio of 209% is approximately, and I'm just reading here, 67.57% or about 2.2 standard deviations above the historical trend line suggesting yeah. that and i know for those non-math people are like what are you trying to say or what are you even saying and i get that because i don't know but this part long the short of it is the stock market is strongly overvalued relative yep. to gdp so buffett at one point had said this was one of his most reliable or favorite indicators he's in terms of you know trying to figure out if market valuations were where they should be or if they were overvalued. He's kind of backed off that a little bit, but still does use this. And you think this is a good indication? Do you think he's right? Yeah, I, well, look, he's got a history of being right a lot more than he's wrong. Um, so that True. definitely bodes in his favor, right? There's a reason everybody knows his name. Um, now, and what you said uh, is is also true. He doesn't really say in advance a lot about what he's doing or why he's doing it. And it's only in hindsight we can see, um, you know, looking back uh, why he was doing what he was doing. And so this Buffett indicator uh, named after after him was something that he's uh, used a lot in the past uh, to help him figure out, you know, should I buy or should I sell? And uh, there is a lot of a lot of math in there, like you mentioned, for the people that want to go through it. But to sort of summarize it, and, and just hit the nuts and, and bolts, the basic idea is uh, when you're investing in the stock market, you're investing or betting, if you will, on the future growth of our economy. And uh, our economy and all that we output every year is our GDP. And so you want this Buffett indicator to be at 100% or below and that means that there is a lot of potential in our economy for more growth versus what we're currently putting out. And that means it's a good time to invest, right? It's, it's getting a good deal on something. Um, like they say, you know, buy low, uh, buy low, sell high, that sort of thing. And so uh, what this is telling us is that 209%, we are very strongly overvalued in the market right now, meaning a lot of people have dumped money into the stock market, and it has uh, it's there's there's more uh, being traded in the market than we're currently really producing out of our economy, and that's a big sign of a potential bubble. Um, sure. And so that's the the big concern <laughs> is I, I know people have seen some strong growth in the stock market over the last several years. Um, and that's great, but this may be a time to really consider, should I pull some of my uh, 
you know, my cards off the table and maybe take some of that cash, maybe take some of those gains that, that, uh, that you've uh, gotten over the last few years and put those into a different area. Uh, that's what Warren has been doing himself, like you mentioned, selling off uh, some of his uh, uh, larger positions and holding uh, cash uh, and tangibles, uh, incidentally, and uh, you know maybe waiting for the time to get back into the market uh, after after uh, that inevitable dip, which we, you know we've seen some little bumps, but we really haven't seen anything too major uh, since around 2010 or so. And so we are, you know, long overdue. It's been a good run, but, um, you know, it, it always comes comes down at some point. Uh, and I'm not anti-stock market by by any means, but um, when, you, when you see it as blown up as much as it is, is now and 209%, uh, you know, over uh, valued in this ratio uh, currently, it's definitely a time to, to you know, think about at least pulling some of that off the table, maybe using it as an opportunity to get into tangibles, uh, you know, uh, getting into uh, precious metals, maybe the right type of real estate, that sort of thing, and just shifting things around a little bit. Sir. Sure. Well, you know, to, and to be fair, in the in the article, you know, they do talk about um, the 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 criticisms. It's right in mm -hmm. the article. Criticisms of the Buffett indicator. Mm -hmm. They suggest, you know, how interest rates are not properly factored into the equation uh, as it pertains to how stocks are valued in relation to other investments like such as bonds as an, as an example right. but that's not really totally accurate either because uh, th you know that the, at the end of the day stocks and bonds are other type of investments and assets out there and you could make a strong argument that they kind of are naturally factored into each of the markets, all the markets, interest rates, yeah. you know, is really what kind of sets the tone for a lot of things. So I, I read through that part and I, and I understand what they're trying to say, but I don't know if I fully agree with it. And especially on the, the other one, I don't agree with on international sales. I use the example of Amazon and how they sell in other nations as in the example mm -hmm. they give is India and how those international sales don't get factored in, you know, to these valuations as much. Well, they do because it's it's factored into the stock price. So, right. But but even all that aside, okay, let's just let's just give them the benefit of the doubt with the international sales and the interest rates. You're still talking two hundred and nine percent. So so if even if you factor those in, what is that? What what percent does that chop off? Does it right. take it from two hundred and nine percent to one ninety or yeah. one eighty? Maybe it's yeah. still overvalued. And then once you get past all that, Chris. The other thing you can look at is, you know, Buffett, we know, has been selling off stocks. Right. So no matter how he's come, this this gauge, this measure that he's used is suggesting that stocks are overvalued. But certainly he probably does, and he, they say he does, he uses other things as well. And at the end of the day, the reason his name is so well known, which you already said, is because the guy doesn't make many wrong decisions when it comes to investing. <laughs> and follow his lead he's he is telling you in no uncertain terms by his actions that he's selling out of this marketplace and likely because he believes it's overvalued and he has right. said so much as that now related to all this market stuff this next this next um article talking about interest rates and talking about all the various other things in our economy 20 percent of households making over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year live paycheck to paycheck that's huge. Yeah. 20, I mean, twenty percent people making one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. That's a that's a good household uh, income. And yep. living pay, paycheck to paycheck, they get into that where you know th some of these people they were in a, a, a higher income bracket, so they bought bought you know more expensive homes and they bought uh, maybe more expensive cars and all those various things. But you know, at the end of the day. You know, there. Yes, that could, that is part of the problem, but I and I don't. I'll let you talk about this here. But the one interesting point, and I think very very valid point, one of the 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 bold highlighted areas of this whole article, they talk about how a hundred and fifty thousand dollar house in in the year nineteen eighty eight now costs seven hundred and seven thousand dollars. Yeah, and I can tell you this. The vast majority of anyone who was affording a hundred and fifty thousand dollar home back in nineteen eighty eight 
their their probably their income back in eighty eight may have been fifty to a hundred grand. Their inc- that same type of of earner in today's economy is not making five hundred six hundred thousand dollars to keep right. pace with those rising home costs. But this is this is a true reflection of our new economy, and it's not yeah. a good economy. And as we talked about, it's not something that. I think is properly being addressed by the government, by the Fed. And that's why, they, like they say in this thing, thank you, Fed. Like the Fed is actually more responsible for this than not. And I don't, I don't see anybody talking about how to get us out of this mess. Do you? No. Uh, and I think the reason being um, there, there isn't, there isn't an easy fix. Um, you know, we've, we've, we, when you think about it, go back to, you know, the fifties and sixties in this country um, you know, you could live on one person's income, you know, at that, that time, a lot of our, our mothers stayed home, uh, to help raise the kids, right. R- uh, kind of run the household while dad went off and worked. And that was, a that was enough money, that one income, uh, because our, our dollar was so strong, our costs were low, that one income was enough to raise a family. Um, I can understand now having, having two kids of my own, um, and especially now, you know, putting them putting them through college, the cost of everything has gone up so much that even with a hundred and fifty thousand dollar income, uh, you know, twenty percent of the people out there still are living paycheck to paycheck because of all the expenses. And when you when you really add it up, and I know that yes, some of it is families, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, living beyond uh, their their means. You know, maybe buying nicer vehicles than they should, things like that. Uh, but again, you know, even going out and getting a, a modest pickup truck, let's say, um, as a new vehicle is forty thousand dollars and up. I mean, you know, uh, it, it can easily go into the eighty to one hundred k range nowadays. So, all of our costs have have gone up so much; it's affecting a lot of people. And what they they uh, you know didn't say in the headline there, nearly half of all the people that responded we're living paycheck to paycheck. And what that's really done is kind of divide our, our country into the haves and the have nots. And, uh, and it's almost, I mean, we're almost at that 50, 50 mark. And so there are people that are doing okay, that were able to buy homes, uh, early enough. We're able to refinance them when rates were down in the two and a half to, you know, three and a half percent range and they're doing okay. But the people that aren't in that group, uh, their rents have gone up. And they can't afford to buy a home because, like like you pointed out, you know, a, a, a typical home now can cost over seven hundred thousand dollars, and uh, so you know they they don't have the savings for the down payment, and even with it, uh, with uh, interest rates uh, up up near seven percent um, for for a thirty year mortgage, they can't afford the payments. So um, it's a it's a tough situation, and it's it's affecting a lot of people, and even the people that are fortunate enough to have the home, you know, the haves, um, they're kind of stuck in their house. At least they have it, right? But they're kind of stuck there because they, they can't get rid of their 3% mortgage um, and, and go buy another home because they can't afford to pay, even though they're in a better situation, they can't afford to pay uh, the 7% uh, new loan for the home that they would be getting. So it, it's a bad situation for a lot of people. Um, you know, I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to continue to see, uh, you know, more uh, households where uh, both parents work. And not only that, maybe both parents have side gigs as well. I mean, that's really common. We know a lot of people uh, in our friend groups that that have second and third jobs and uh, pick up hours here and there or are trying to start their own business on the side uh, and still scraping together to 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 make ends meet. And, um, sure. you know, it, it, even if you're a hard, it used to be, you know, just, uh, just work hard and you'll be okay. Well, now it takes two people working hard and being smart and making the right decisions, uh, to, to be okay. And that's just a difficult situation for, for most everybody. Right. Right. And, you know, it is easy to get lost in the whole, like you said, keeping up with the Jones dynamic, but it, it's much bigger than that because we've been, we've been, looking at this and talking about this all year where you know you it's th- the same thing that's causing these earners of 150 grand a year 20% of these $150,000 a year earners to be living paycheck to paycheck 
that the factors that are causing that largely are the same factors that are causing retirees to have to go back to work because their their retirement savings isn't stretching as far as they expected it to because the inflationary costs are running away. Yeah. It's the same thing with, you know, families that even less than who haven't bought new cars, who haven't bought expensive homes that are that, but we're just middle, middle income, middle class earners that have had to use their credit card, their savings just to put food on the family's table. And so they yeah. didn't make those big mistakes. And this is exactly why, you know, that, that quote from Alan Greenspan in 1966, where he said, in the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to prevent confiscation of savings through inflation. That's said by Alan Greenspan. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely true. And that's that's why, you know, again, a well-balanced portfolio with metals in it as a diversification, a hedge. If the, if the government isn't going to have a gold standard on their currency, we sure better have our own gold standard for our currency because at the end of the day, this process that the the Fed has been embarking upon for decades now, uh, it looks to be, looks as though it's really kind of run its course and it's kind of running out of running out of runway, if you will. Yeah, where we might have a little bit of a crash landing here. Hopefully not, but you know we're fighting math and fighting math is a lot like fighting gravity, not one you're probably going to win. <laughs> That's right. So, anyway, well, all right, Crystal, thank you for that, and for those yeah. tuning in. If you'd like to learn more about putting gold in your investment portfolio, albeit your retirement savings or your non-retirement savings, uh, you can do so by contacting our office at 1-800-289-2646. It is online at SwissAmerica.com, S-W-I-S-S -S America, all one word, dot com. And please subscribe to our podcast. We'd love to stay in contact with you and bring you more information like this. And other than that, have a great rest of your day, great rest of your week. And Chris, thanks for being here. Of course. Yep. Take care.